So now we can uh, move on to the general open discussion. So if I have anyone interested in making first question, if I could please ask people to identify themselves by name and organization, if appropriate. And uh, we also have some questions coming through um, from uh, outside as well, but uh, let's see what we have from the floor first. I'll look on this side first, anybody? Right, we have one here in the front. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, oh. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, that got to you first. Uh, well, oh, let's take you first and then, okay. yes, Sorry please. about that. Um, Charles Knox Wibmanoff from HelpAge International. Um, just say, first of all, I think all the presentations were really, really interesting and the um, recommendations and lessons and outcomes are really, really fascinating. There's lots to kind of digest there. Um, my, my question links slightly to actually something that Jen brought up, which is that um, when looking at the question of, of accountability around cash transfers and the recommendations that come out of this report, most of them focus really on the supply side, which is around questions such as how to create feedback channels, grievance mechanisms within the programs, um, improve governance, M&E &E systems, which is all really, really important. Um, but especially when that comes to grievance mechanisms and feedback channels, as I think was alluded to in some of the early presentations, that kind of assumes that there's an empowered citizenship who uh, understand programs and are ready to, to, to kind of um, to, to, to make complaints and things like this, which, as we know, isn't the case. Um, now, as we know, these social protection programs, and I think the case of Uganda seemed to bring this out as well as Kenya, can actually s stimulate that. that it's, uh, cash seems to have quite a symbolic um, importance and quite a distinct nature in, 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 in its role in that state citizen contract. Um, but really, there's, a whole th there's this whole other side of the story. And beyond this room, there's a whole other big e d debate, development debate around accountability, um, which again, Jen referred to. So I guess uh, what my, my question is, um, from the panel and others in the room, what lessons can we take from this, not just for the supply side of cash transfers, but also for, ha for the strengthening of um, civil society organizations, you know, to become um, representative and strong players so they can actually hold these, these, these programs to account themselves? Thank you, very interesting point. Does anyone on the panel want to take that question? Group them? Okay, we'll group them. So let's go for your, your question next, please. Um, Anna Hirsch-Holland uh, from British Red Cross, uh, the recovery team of British Red Cross. Um, you mentioned the um, erosion of or the potential of social uh, transfer programs um, to erode local support networks. I just wondered if you had any kind of specific examples of where that was the case and if there's any advice on how to avoid that. Thank you. I'll take one more in this round, yes. Hi, Rob Page from the International Development Select Committee. Um, I've got two questions which are um, both principally directed at, at Fiona and Nicola. Um, the first is to do with the quotes that you um, put up in your PowerPoint and particularly the negative ones. I appreciate that the purpose of your work was to be qualitative and therefore not to um, gather statistics or use surveys or anything like that. But that notwithstanding, I wonder if you're able to give some impression of the extent to which these negative quotes reflected isolated cases or the extent to which you think some of them might reflect broader problems. Um, thinking particularly of the ones about um, intra-household relations and tensions which come out of that. Uh, the second question is a bit more um, specific about food security. Um, in our work um, just now, we're, we're looking at the impact of social protection and cash transfers in terms of food security and nutrition. Um, we've looked particularly at Ethiopia, but I wondered if you had any examples of that coming out of the research that you've done um, in the five countries that you looked at. Thank you. Well, I think there's four questions there. So um, one is on empowered, whether you need an empowered citizenship and how you can help to uh, stimulate that through strengthening civil society. Does anyone have any comments on that one? S sorry. <laughs> <laughs> empowered citizenship and strengthening civil society. Yeah, I think it's a, a good point. I mean, I guess uh, what we would emphasize is the, you know, the real need to improve uh, information flows. Um, and so that's where we really highlighted the importance of investing in uh, a 
awareness raising initiatives with citizens. I mean, I, I think you're right that uh, people aren't going to utilize uh, the grievance mechanisms until they feel much more comfortable about its purpose um, and, and aware of, of what the procedures are. There didn't seem to be a lot of transparent information available at the community level. So I think we would very much see having to put together all six um, clusters of recommendations if you're really going to, to get traction on the demand side. Um, but I, I think that's why we also wanted to distinguish between the importance of having grievance mechanisms and appeals, which seems to be what a lot of the, the discourse is about at the moment in terms of program governance, and to actually say, well, we need to have more embedded and institutionalized feedback mechanisms, which don't have to be about um, people being upset because they've been um, unfairly excluded, but it's also just about providing regular information, whether positive or negative. Um, to implementers so that you can have a much more holistic picture of, of how people are experiencing the programs. Um, and I think that the you know, opportunity to uh, identify success cases is also really critical there. So people can see um, examples of where the cash has made a difference, but where they might also have used some of these um, other types of communication or, or grievance channels. Okay, important questions, if I have to, s to say some uh, few words. Uh, start with food security. Uh, when we are talking now in Palestine about the uh, social protection strategy, we are trying, with the WFB mainly, and UNRWA, to develop a food security strategy. Because frankly, we don't have a strategy for food security. We have the food aid component here and there. What's new in this regard is that the WFD is uh, an important partner for us in the social protection. And when we were working with them to develop uh, their own strategy as WFD for the four years to come, they were aligned with the social protection strategy interventions. Another interesting point when it's not necessarily the outcomes of this assessment, when we are asking the beneficiaries, I'm not sure if it was part of the assessment or not, uh, how do they spend the benefit? Most of them say the majority of the benefit are going to food. Taking into consideration that in addition to food, in addition to cash, they are receiving food aid from the ministry. The food security, food aid, social protection, cash are interrelated together. The idea is that, frankly, we are trying to develop a proxy or a module for uh, within the questionnaire, when we are targeting the households for cash, to insert the variables for the food security. Why is this important? Because when we are analyzing the data and uh, put the criteria for eligibility for cash, we will do it again for food, taking into consider consideration whether the household or the family is food secure or not. What's happening now, who are entitled to cash, mainly the extremely poor, are entitled to receive the food aid. And it does uh, this is not uh, necessarily the right case for all the households. If they are food secure, they can re uh, receive one single intervention. It's not necessary for them to take more than one intervention. But food security for us is very important, and Palestine, we are working with WFB, to develop a strategy for food security and incorporate food security variables and the, on the nutritional basis into the questionnaire in the Bruxelles this form. Um, any comments on this end, or shall we move on to the next? Do you, Do you want to focus on those c question by question? Or uh, well, yes, so we're still actually on the, the first one. erosion of local networks, but I think we'll put that to Fiona and also the. Um, Issue about the negative comments, how representative they are. Do you want to answer those, Fiona? Just a quick reflection on the um, on that first question on, on the supply and demand. I think I think if you, you know, the governance literature to overly simplify is basically supply alone, demand alone doesn't work. It's about how they link, and I think that that's where we need to sit on any of the of these discussions and in any sector, whether it's health, education, social welfare services. Um, and it's it's about thinking about have we got the right instruments and, and ways of of encouraging that. Um, I think the, ref the recommendations reflect some of the gaps in the supply side, but that doesn't replace the fact that it needs to look at how they interrelate. Uh, interrelate. Um, equally, just supporting the demand side, of course, can raise expectations that don't go anywhere. I mean, that's relatively simple. 
Um, thanks for the very, very useful questions. Um, I, I might try and deal with the two eroding local support networks and the, the sort of negative quote slightly together because somehow they are related. Um, in terms of the details of ero eroding local support networks, these were we found cases, for instance, in Mozambique, and I think there was the, there was a quote up there when um, was it Mozambique? No, it was Uganda when people were saying that the children who used to help them are no longer helping them because they know that they're the older people in the households are getting money. So in a way, that, that that's how it was reflected. Also in Kenya, for instance, um, they were saying that, that previously orphans and vulnerable children would be taken care of in households automatically. It was the, the duty of them. But now it was, much, it was becoming a bit of a monetarized issue because they knew that the orphans would, would you know, sort of associated with money. Um, but how, however, and sort of responding to your question, these were, I mean, we, we tried to put a number on it, and, you know, for people did ask us to put a number on sort of in terms of the percentage of types of responses that, you know, that's that, you know, people talked about the negative effects. Um, and they were very low, and they were, you know, relatively isolated. And I think the sort of, the sort of response that was coming from the, the sort of in Kenya, for instance, through the community implementers at, at community level, they were saying, with raising awareness, you know, increasing the information provision at that level, people were, were sort of changing and they were becoming more aware of, you know, what it was all about. And so, so you know, so I think it sort of links also to the other questions around, you know, more awareness raising, more information provision. Eventually, you know, people are, are aware that, that these, these negative conditions might not happen, these negative effects might not happen. So in short, I think that they were, they were, they were isolated and I think over time, with change and, and, and awareness raising, this, this, this will change. Thank you. I don't know, Amanda, if you want to say something about uh, empowering civil society to be able to <coughs> encourage more self-reporting and so forth. Um, well, and th there, is, there is a role for civil society organizations there in terms of um, uh, improving the accountability of the delivery agencies uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the general public and also to the, uh, to the beneficiaries in, in the kind of um, point about intermediation, the civil society organizations will be probably part of that kind of intermediation that is needed to get, to get um, that sort of working. Um, but um, the question is how much should we depend on that? And, and, and here is uh, something really intriguing, because if you look at, not perhaps necessarily just at the, f at the cases that we've looked at, but um, it m more generally about sort of social protection uh, programs and initiatives, even sort of going back in history, uh, you find that demand has not been that significant. By demand, I mean people going on the streets and saying, we want social protection. You normally don't have that. The people sort of demand sort of justice, demand fairness, but they don't kind of, uh, th there are no kind of movements of that. I mean, the only one recently that I can recall is um, Bolivian, um, Bolivian pensioners that did a kind of march on uh, the, the, the capital in Bolivia to uh, demand the reinstatement of their kind of social pension. But that is usually a responsive rather than an, an initiating thing. And, 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 and the question is, should be worried about that? Should should be a concern, and I don't I don't think so. I mean, if you if you if you look at the first social protection in intervention in in the world ever, which is this um, uh, pension and disability scheme in Germany, uh, introduced by Bismarck, uh, there was no there was no demand for it. He, the, the objective that uh, he had in introducing it was to uh, preclude the, the the demands from uh, social movements and particularly socialist movements at the time in Germany. So um, in a sense, perhaps w w we need to think at this, m at this more carefully. But uh, um, in very few cases, you, you have this situation where you've got demand and sort of government response. It's much more uh, social protection grows much more organically as part of social contracts than in this kind of demand supply fa fashion. Okay. Thank you very much, Armando. Uh, over here, we haven't had any. Uh, Yet anyone speaking from there? I can see a hand up here at the front. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, thanks so much for the presentation. It's been very interesting. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm the Daniel Mont from the University College of London. And my question has to do with the people who are not on the program. 
um, uh, were you able to investigate um, uh, the barriers that people faced uh, com coming on the program and the, and the reasons for people, uh, the program not reaching them. And I'm thinking in part w with uh, people with disabilities and not in the program in Mozambique, but the other programs, right? About 15, uh, World Report says that about 15% of the world has a disability, about 4% it's severe enough to maybe uh, qualify for a disability program per se, but that means that that there could be barriers in the other programs for their for their participating. And that also relates back to the stigma uh, issue as well. I mean, one reason for not finding people with who feel a lot of stigma on the program is because they're not on the program because they they have that reaction to it. So I'm, I'm concerned, uh, I'm wondering uh, if you looked at that population and what was preventing them from, from uh, participating on the programs. Thank you very much. We'll take another two questions. Any more from right over there? One more at the back, yes. Thank you, uh, Caroline Harper from ODI. I'm um, in the social development program. Um, my question is about um, the, the institutional capacity, um, which has been mentioned from several angles, to deliver, um, and how indeed we do, um, over time, build up capacity. And Amando mentioned that um, even in the UK, the higher education system has, or in the West, failed to deliver very well on some of these skills that are needed. Um, and I just wondered how the panel um, would respond to that in terms of the fact that actually we've been asking about this for at least 20, 25 years in broadly in this sector. Um, not just social workers, but the broader skills as well uh, that are needed in the sort of social sector to deliver on this. So it'd be interesting to hear both from maybe Maxine about higher education, um, but also anyone else on the panel, um, from donors or government people, um, about how they think we can actually increase capacity in this area. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question. Uh, yes, at the back there. In the middle, this lady here, yes. Hi, I'm Ashley Groom. I'm from Developing Markets Associates. Um, and my question is around financial literacy um, and you know the potential for having financial literacy programs connected with these cash transfer programs particularly as there is the hope that people will graduate from these programs and achieve financial independence for some, <coughs> or you know, the hope to link some of these cash transfer programs with other financial tools. Um, and then you know, financial literacy could help with awareness of citizen rights and things like that. So I don't know if anyone on the panel has any ideas of you know, implementing some of these programs or connecting them with the cash transfer programs. Thank you very much indeed. So we have three questions. Uh, one on how programs uh, can do better to encourage people who may be marginalized from them, such as the disabled, one on institutional capacity, and one on financial literacy programs. So let's start with the first one. Um, and I think that's a question to direct to um, our team here. No, I think it's a really uh, important question, particularly, as you said, for, for people with uh, disabilities. I mean, I will speak because I was involved in the, the research with Mohammed in the West Bank. And even there, where compared to the African context, you've got much shorter distances, a number of people we talked to said that that was a real issue. So particularly with female-headed households who had care burdens, I mean, often we... We came across a number of cases where people had multiple family members with disabilities and that they had struggled to find adequate time and support to go and register. Because it's not just turning up to the office to put in your application form, it's then having to get all the, the supporting documentation as well. Um, and so older women that we talked to who had tried to find a proxy who could go and do some of that legwork had been refused. So they had now um, been trying to get the support of some civil society organizations to help play that, that mediation role, but it was definitely um, a major challenge. And it wasn't just um, you know, for families with disabilities, but also um, female-headed households who had you know, large numbers of, of young children. That, that was definitely a concern. I mean, part of the, the other concern is that because there's such a high caseload the social workers are not, they don't have the time uh, or resources to go and actively seek out people. So they can respond to applications, um, but there's not the time to go and, 
and um, you know, talk to communities to find out who might be excluded. Although I think now these new uh, community monitoring networks are trying to bring together community knowledge to say, well, such and such should be included. Um, we need to find ways to support them. So th there is a movement to try and improve that, but it's, it's definitely a, a critical barrier at the moment. I don't know if you want to talk to the other cases. Mm, yeah, ju just quickly. Um, yes, barriers also in, in, the, in, the, in the African countries, um, beyond the, the, the Mozambique case where people with disabilities uh, were targeted, are, are focused on. Um, for instance, I in Uganda, the older people talked about problems in, in distance. In, 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 in receiving the payments. Um, um, there are some, and I think our partners can probably talk more about that, you know, if they'd like to contribute as well. I think there, there are some um, measures being taken, put in place to try and um, c get around these issues. So for instance, in Kenya, they have alternates, so people can nominate somebody else in, in the household who can actually go and collect um, the money. Um, and I think, but, uh, but I do, tend to agree with with what um, Armando was also saying, that there d didn't appear to be so much stigma in terms of people being on the program. It didn't appear to be, at least fr from the African countries. Uh, maybe the, the MENA countries are a bit different, but th that's the sense that I got from the African countries. But again, I think it would be quite nice to hear from... Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, I would bring in the experience from Uganda, because I participated in the study in Uganda. And people were struggling to get on the program. So issues of stigma and discrimination um, as a result of being on a program, really there was no evidence to support anything to do with that. Uh, much as we actually, I think if I remember correctly, we had issues around stigma in our tool, but One. yeah, but I could not see, uh, we couldn't get anything around that, even with the triangulation of the different methods. Um, but I agree with the, uh, Fiona that uh, around issues of disability, there were alternate recipients. So there, there was a lot of agency and creativity from, from the community level and also from the program to make sure that issues of distance, especially if it is physical disability, are taken care of. But we know that disability is, is heterogeneous. So if it is not about if it is not physical disability, if you suffer intellectual disability or other forms of disability, there are challenges around that because the service providers, for example, if you are deaf, do not know the sign language. So there are issues around communication uh, and the social workers working on the program are not competent in handling uh, certain aspects of disability. Thank you. Are there any other partners who'd like to say something? Yes, please. I think in Palestine, uh, when they started the cash, they made public advertisement in TV, and they said anyone can apply, even the president of Umazin. So, <laughs> so anyone can apply, and rece they receive thousands of uh, applicants. So the problem is, uh, is how to cover those people, because we have a wi long waiting list. Although we don't have a proactive targeting, as Nicola mentioned, but we have a loss, we have a long list of people, especially in Gaza. Traditionally, it was it used to be a stigma for people, but now because it's uh, it's more linked to the political economy, and people don't work because they are not allowed to work, and because of the occupation and the political situation, so people are less blaming themselves, and it became like as if it's natural to seek social assistance. So the reality is being reshaped and structured by people based on their context. So it used to be a stigma, but not anymore. And now the lucky ones are the ones who got the cash, uh, the cash assistance from those who don't work. Thank you. Uh, I, I would just uh, say that uh, the comment has come in from uh, one of the people listening uh, to, to, to uh, what we're doing here. And, and it makes an interesting point, saying that perhaps um, the difference between Africa and Europe, especially UK, in terms of the issue of stigma is down to the fact the financial resources for CTs in Africa come mainly from donors, and in Europe they come from taxes. Uh, this is uh, a question from Chapido Nayamongo in Birmingham. Thank you for that, um, for that comment. Something to think about anyway. Uh, we have a few more um, uh, comments actually on, on some of these questions. But the institutional capacity issue 
Um, would you like to say yes. something about that? This is a very important field of uh, development on the government level. <coughs> and frankly, because of the limited financial resources for us, the, the least money we, we pay for uh, human resources development and institutional building. And we are lucky by the, the projects of the human resources development and capacity building when they are funded by our main partners from the EU, the World Bank, or DFID, or uh, this is the situation. But we are in need of certain uh, interventions for uh, capacity building, uh, mainly for the social workers and uh, some of the financial even uh, cost analysis and uh, some activities of monitoring and evaluation, yes. Uh, in the government as a whole, we are now uh, uh, studying or making an assessment with also funded by the EU on how to reform the civil uh, service uh, sector. And part of this will be how to uh, at least allocate resources to capacity building and institutional arrangements. Uh, all of what we are saying, improving and developing the concepts, the policies and the programs should be accompanied not only by institutional uh, capacity or uh, human resource development. We need also legislative reform sometimes. And we need a lot of uh, IT uh, development. Even though we feel we are lucky in Palestine, we have a developed IT environment and we have a very strong uh, Central Bureau of Statistics. But we still need institutional ca capacity and uh, human resources development in certain areas, yes. As for stigma, if I to have uh, to add, now the people, when they complain to the, we have uh, many levels for complaint. They directly complain to the local uh, committee in the district office. If they have negative answer, they complain directly to the ministry. There is an upper complaint unit. And now they, don't, they do not complain uh, to the ministry. They directly go to the media because they have the perception that when you make your case public, the minister will intervene directly. This is uh, another one is for a human rights organization. You don't imagine how many letters and questionnaires and questions from human rights organizations approaching us, please report what's the situation of this household because they are complaining that they are not receiving and they are poor or uh, the stigma was before, uh, let me tell you, uh, when the banks refused to pay or to deliver the payments for the poor in the working days. In the past, they insisted that on holiday I can open banks for the poor because they won't want to mix with ordinary customers. Imagine. And what we did uh, recently in Palestine, now all the poor households have bank accounts as ordinary accounts. And they have uh, HML cards and they can, whenever they can go and collect their payment, rather than bringing them on Saturday, everyone passing by the bank will uh, know that these are the beneficiaries of the cash and the, these are the poor. Uh, and we are in the process of uh, uh, finalizing the bank accounts now in Gaza. And the next payment, we are expecting Gaza to join the bank accounts. These are sometimes, yani we are uh, the institutional uh, stigmatization. It's not the people who are classifying others. Some of sometimes it's the institutions who are uh, discriminating against people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, do you want to say something about institutional capacity? Yes, um, I, it's obviously a key issue that we've talked about for a long time. Um, and I don't, I don't think there's, there's necessarily easy answers. And I think uh, often this is decided in countries. So this is sort of a, a quite a personal probably reflection o overall. Um, I think that there, there are some real issues with, there are obviously some very real choices about institutionally where these types of in, uh, investments and programs and um, policies sit. Um, and often no easy answers where you're trying to gain a combination of social policy and social welfare um, linked with a, a real capacity to deliver and with sort of implementing agency type um, capacity to deliver. And sometimes I think we could be better at sort of bringing together sort of two ministries that, that link together perhaps 
um, rather than assuming that one has all the skills to do that, but trying to narrow down the range of ministries that, that need to coordinate, but sort of forging really strong partnerships between two. I think some, it's interesting that some continents and countries have evolved much faster, so certainly work that we've done in the past in East Asia, a real sense that building up social welfare ministry, social affairs ministry capacity and social worker competency has been something for investment, but that hasn't played out um, in every uh, context. And the investments in that, in particularly in Africa, I'd say, have been quite fragmented <coughs> in how they've been driven. And, and some of that sits on a sort of donor and agenda uh, side where the OVC agenda, for example, has driven quite a lot of investment in thinking about social welfare capacity more broadly. Equally, it's sort of it's been pushed from maybe the gender uh, side or or wider community development. And I think sometimes the ministries that we're talking about sit in that area of fragmentation and and sort of competing, overlapping but com sort of competing agendas that we also need to be cognizant of when we're engaging with them from different ways and, and yourselves to enable a, a more coherent a, approach. Um, but I think that we, obviously building institutional capacity is a core part of, of system strengthening and that's one of the core challenges, I think, in terms of, of moving forward. Thank you. Yes, please, Armando. Um, um, thanks a lot. Can I, I, I follow up on, on the on, on the issue of capacity, because I think this is really important. Um, the, um, we, we sort of covered the issue of uh, the, need, the need for social workers, the need for intermediation. I think we need to, uh, that, that it has a few implications of thinking through social transfers in that way. Um, um, for example, perhaps we shouldn't think about them in terms of development in, in, in interventions, but more in terms of institution building. Uh, notice that what we're discussing now is the, the, what ministry deals with it, how is the ministry organized, uh, what resources the ministries have. Um, Latin American countries have moved in that direction, and most uh, Latin American countries have ministries of social development that are in charge of addressing poverty and vulnerability, whereas the ministries of labor and, and social security address the issue of social insurance. So you, you have there a kind of institutional response, and that has the effect of uh, professionalizing the work of social workers and creating ca career structures and so on. I think that is very important. It also has implications for the use of technology because, I, I, I mean, I don't know whether it's my own impression, but I think we're perhaps too obsessed with the way in which new technology can help deliver social transfer programs. Uh, and we tend to see them as saving money and, and creating this gap, you know, basically taking away intermediation. Whereas I think we need to think uh, about technology in, in support of social transfers as, as improving the productivity of, of, of social workers rather than jumping over them, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I think that, that has an implication, an implication there. And it also has an implication for the kind of training uh, that, that we offer, um, uh, not, not just in the UK but also in European countries. Um, in the, I, I kind of fond of telling this anecdote. In, in um, all my kind of travels when I work in different countries around social protection, only once I found uh, a social policy graduate uh, from a university in the UK. The majority of them were economists, uh, lawyers, um, you know, people with those anthropologists, particularly social scientists, but very few. So there is something in the way that we teach social policy that is not very kind of uh, conducive to, uh, to, to helping people get the right skills. Thank you. Thanks very much, Armando. I think the, the next question, and I'm slightly aware of the time um, which we had put before us, was about really about exit strategies, and, and one in particular was mentioned, which is financial literacy programs. So since it's such an important part of um, you know, our thinking about we want to go beyond giving people cash to thinking about how they might escape poverty, and um, as Dawood said, to think about more transformative um, ways of uh, relating to tra cash transfers. So perhaps this question could be thought about in, in, in terms of sort of exit strategies more generally. Does anyone want to start on the panel responding to that question? Yes, I, I can admit that we uh, are not uh, succeeding yani in the on this component for the exit strategy, frankly. But what we are trying to do, even on the policy level, is that 
when, we are to when I talked about case management and the demands-driven uh, uh, services, that it's not necessary to accept all the people on the same program. From the first moment, when you are analyzing the situation and the human capital of the family, taking into consideration, you we have uh, another component in our social protection strategy, which is the economic empowerment program. Those people, after being scored and screened by the PMTF, and we have their score of poverty, and we have all the characteristics, the socioeconomic characteristics of them, they could directly be channeled to receive a grant or a microcredit to launch their own enterprises. And this is what we are trying to do in the exit strategy, is how to uh, employ this program, which is the economic empowerment, to take those who are on my payroll for the cash, and to start working with them with the grants or microcredits to start generating income and uh, maintain uh, self-reliance. Uh, exit strategy also sometimes we are talking about uh, because we are uh, always under uh, the pressure of time for the cash transfer program procedures and uh, operations. We have no time to talk to the family and to listen to their priorities and what do they prefer do they need sometimes an employment, for example. The, the issue is that employment is not under my control, even though we haven't a very big uh, intervention for unemployment. It has to be channeled to another ministry. Here was uh, the institutional arrangements, so I talked about the horizontal one between the line ministries, that the social worker could directly, at the local level, coordinate with the employment office, or with the private sector institutions, because the private sector should intervene in this regard under the corporate social responsibility. They are always collecting money. They have to contribute to the social protection and under the social responsibility. But they, uh, of course, they, uh, they are right when they are asking about criteria or transparency or accountability, that's right. But we could provide this, but they can join in this playground because they are, not, they are doing nothing. They are the main generator for social exclusion because all the policy for economic activities, for example, are not inclusive, just for the benefits, gaining benefits. When you are talking about women, they don't prefer to employ women because mainly if they are married, because after one year she will be pregnant, put it aside, disability the same, youth. Uh, but when we are talking about the macro level, all the policies, all the policies on the macro level should be pro Poor. Now it's not pro poor. Bovarti is Ministry of Social Affairs. We have nothing to do with this or vulnerability. Disability go to Ministry of Social Affairs. My taxation system sometimes can generate more poor people to the country or my employment strategies. If all the macro level policies are not pro poor, I assure you no exit strategy from Bovarti. You are expecting more people to fall into Bovarti cycle. Thank you. Okay, let's take some more questions. Yes, front row. Um, hi, I'm Matthew Greenslade. Um, I'm an economist in DFID. I work on social protection policy. Um, I'd like to say thanks very much for to the team for this for this research, and thanks to Heather Kindness on the DFID side for doing such a great job um, managing it from our side. Um, I just wanted to, to switch a bit and look at things from the sort of um, donor programming point of view. I mean, I spend all my time looking at sort of program cost-benefit analysis and numbers and charts and triangles, etc. I mean, that's my sort of that's my particular ghetto. But I was I was really inspired actually by this. I read the Kenya and the Uganda reports, and it, and it was a real eye opener. I just sat down one day and you know read the things properly. Um, and it really opened my eyes, I think partly because, um, you know, the work was well done, partly because it was very well communicated. I mean, I, I loved the sort of the videos that were circulated um, by email, and, and, and it was partly because, I, you know, I just sat down, um, you know, to, to read this stuff properly, um, which, to be honest, I don't normally do. Um, I mean, my question is, when you try and summarize um, this sort of research, when, when messages go up the line in organizations like DFID, you know, 
detail gets lost um, and, and the richness gets lost. And, you know, on the quantified benefit side, it's all easy to put things into table tables and crunch things together and to compare across programs and sectors. I mean, how on earth do you communicate some of the sort of the richness and the experiences? I mean, do you try and put things in common formats and have indicators and traffic lights and, you know, and alarm bells or whatever? Or, or is that completely missing the point? Do you have to have the richness? Or do you just rely on, you know, circulating, you know, videos? I mean, perhaps that's part of it. I mean, do you, do you try and quantify the, the benefit? I mean, there's a big sort of, you know, subjective well-being area of research in the UK, which is very hairy, but do you, you know, do you try and go down that route? I mean, these are massive sort of worldwide global <laughs> questions. And you can take this more of a comment rather than someone expecting answers, but um, that's the sort of question that goes to me. But thanks very much. Yes, thank you for that comment. Lots of food for thought. I think, I think our response would be that you have to try and do a lot of things um, simultaneously, and and a, you know, sort of uh, reach a number of different audiences through a number of different means to kind of raise awareness. But also, if you want to do, um, you know, really large-scale qualitative research, which you can do, and it has been done, as Armando says, you have to put a huge amount of resources into that. It's not impossible to do. You can do quants and qual together, but it does take a lot of uh, a lot of money. So I think if there was a huge fund, that's I think what we would like to do. <laughs> so that would be one quick answer. Thank you for the comment. Are there any other questions? There's one down here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for all the uh, presentations. Really, really interesting. Um, I'm Ali Wood from Tier Fund's humanitarian support team. And I was just interested to know um, if uh, uh, my question is around sort of whether there's a kind of cash based distinctive to any of the negative effects found, and just whether the panel has a view on the extent to which some of the issues, and it was great to hear that actually they were quite marginal, or at least you know, there wasn't really a high proportion of those kind of issues coming through, but just whether those uh, issues around of erosion of social cohesion, coping mechanisms, but also the kind of conflict between beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries, if any of those areas you, you felt were specific to the cash-based nature of the programme, as opposed to in-kind assistance programmes, which, as we know, have the potential to cause some of the, kind of the same kinds of issues. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yes, Pilar. Hello, I'm Pilar Domingo from the Governance and Politics Group at ODI. Just wanted to pick up on one of the things that came up from Nicola's presentation that I just quickly found in the report that is fascinating, which is how to cope with or how to engage with contexts um, where, in fact, the state isn't present. It's not only a, a challenge of state capacity, but state, but state absence, and where the figures of authority that beneficiaries are relating to are in fact non-state actors and what kind of governance recommendation needs to come from that and yeah, that it would be really interesting not to lose that mm -hmm. in that process of aggregating up. Um, Thank you very much, Pilar. Um, yes, the front row has caught my eye here. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Isabel Cardinal. I work on social protection and poverty in DFID. I just wondered from the research team whether you've got a view on what maximizes the wider impacts that you talked about around dignity and control. What kind of designs maximize those impacts? Should we take one more given the time? I think perhaps right over there because otherwise they'll get lost. Hi, I'm Ian McCorson from Oxford Policy Management. Um, I thought the presentation was very interesting um, and I was wondering if you had a view on how you might come to an evaluative judgment that balances these positive community impacts and negative community impacts that you raised. Um, I think we've found similar things in many evaluations including of, of some of the programs that you looked at and one of the things that we've always struggled with is how as evaluators to say okay, we find some positive things and we find some negative things. Is this good overall? How do we get to an evaluative judgment? Thank you very much. Those are four very interesting questions. Um, 
Let's take the first one, uh, which is about, uh, is there something intrinsic in uh, delivering cash that generates particular positive or particular ne negative effects? What are, the, what are the sort of intrinsic kind of elements in cash that are good or bad? Yani from our experience, uh, frankly, most of the families prepare cash. It's easy to collect and they feel we are respecting their option for expenditure. And give me the cash and I will decide upon what my priority and I want to disperse here and there. Uh, from the other uh, side and from implementation, th there is a, a, a bad or a negative impact that the households, uh, when you are trying to discuss or negotiate with them yet, that you don't need cash, you need another intervention, directly they refuse. Just give me cash and they will manage the, and it's not a true. Uh, the culture of uh, uh, getting cash from s uh, as a social transfer, and we need to, to work on awareness and communication with the people that uh, sometimes <coughs> you need to change, and uh, we need to change the mentality. Because we have the, what they say that give me something that's very little but continuous rather than give me big intervention for one time. This is something in the psychology and the mentality of the people. We are working with them. Listen, you want to improve your conditions, you don't need cash for six months or, or 12 months. You can go and start working on uh, an income generating project. They prefer cash. They prefer cash instead of taking a grant or a microcredit to launch their own uh, business, a small business. Some of them are uh, eager to have the, some of the families uh, approach us, please help us to generate income. We don't want the cash transfer. But I'm talking about a minority. This is an accumul accumulation of what, what we should do. It's not us only, with all the service providers. The cash is uh, sometimes it's a direct intervention with a quick impact. Sometimes it has its negative uh, impacts. The most dangerous thing is that if the family uh, feel that this is a salary and cash transfer are not a salary, Sh they, should, they should be for a certain period of time and it's not approaching as a, uh, the salaries because this uh, will uh, make the family, it's okay, they are doing some informal activities in the informal sector with the cash benefit, it's okay. Uh, it's, yani, it's very complicated issue when <coughs> we are dealing with cash. In connection with the health insurance and uh, food aid, for example, <coughs> uh, there is always this connection. You, you give me the cash, you, you must com do the other complementary interventions, the health and insurance and the food education. But our point of view is that uh, it's not necessary to be like this way. According to your uh, needs and the case uh, management, you will be channeled to one of the interventions. If you deserve two of them, you can take them. If you don't deserve but one, you will take one. Thank you. things are a set of very interesting questions and there's no time to deal with them um, sufficiently but just to, to reiterate w what uh, Dawood was saying, in all the countries cash was the preferred thing. It was very clear to people that they would rather have cash than something else, that was quite clear. Um, in terms of what maximises the win wider impacts, again I think th the fact that they were given cash was very important because that allowed people to, to have control over their lives. So the issue around control was very important. Um, in terms of the supply issues, I think predictability was a very important thing, as was information provision and awareness raising, sort of all linked to issues around um, transparency. So I think, you know, just a few things there. In terms of, um, you know, how you balance out the negative and positive, um, it, yes, it's a very important question. And we, we did, you know, we, we for instance, put in some reports, like 25% of respondents said that, that there was a negative um, you know, th th there were some negative effects, but, but in a way that didn't really help us. So, because you know, the the depth of that <coughs> negativeness we we didn't really get at. So, so it's something that I think we continue to grapple with. And it would be really nice nice to hear from you how how you guys have, have 
dealt with that? How you know going forward, how we how we could portray that more realistically? And just to complement uh, those points really briefly, um, I mean I think I would agree. Looking at all the the country reports and the transcripts, that cash did provide people with a lot of control unless there was already a very dysfunctional relationship within the family. So where there's issues of drug abuse, then we did see, for example, like on cash um, payment days, sort of a, an escalation of, of violence and, and tensions because of who would then have the control over how that was used. And so that was enabling some, or I guess, yeah, reinforcing some already dysfunctional relationships. So that's something to consider um, and whether people in, in those particular circumstances need to be provided with different sorts of support because that was, it wasn't an isolated case. We did hear that quite a lot in, in the West Bank. Um, the sort of issue about what maximizes impact, um, I, I do think this point that we've been talking about sort of spaces for interaction, so not just between the beneficiaries and the implementers is critical in terms of ensuring you're getting on top of what's really necessary in that community, but also providing spaces where beneficiaries can talk. Um, and people, especially from groups that are um, socially marginalized, I mean, we found that many of the female-headed households we talked to in Palestine emphasized how uh, extreme, in some cases, the, the surveillance was from extended family members and how it was really critical when they could get together with other <coughs> women in similar types of situations and talk about their experiences um, because uh, you know, they didn't have other people in which they could confide, uh, but also how they could then learn about other forms of complementary assistance, so from faith-based organizations, for example, through the Zakat committees or, or other NGOs. So I think this point that um, Amando made about not having technology replace that human interaction, that's absolutely vital. Uh, but also you've got a lot of opportunities to then raise awareness about legislation and people's you know, entitlements to, to programs, but also to be um, free of discriminatory behaviors. Just to pick up really quickly on, on Pilar's point, I mean, one thing that struck us um, was in all the countries how important informal community leaders were as well as ensuring that people had access to the program. So this came out, I think, quite strongly in, in Yemen in particular, where often the um, there was a lot of clientelism or even corruption amongst some of the, the local authorities, but uh, through you know proactive um, interventions by informal leaders, and they were able to ensure that the people who really needed the assistance did get access. So I think thinking about ways in which those types of actors can be supported in fragile state context is, is something we need to spend more time thinking about and doing more research on. I don't know if Khaled made it from the airport, but he might want to, uh, hi, okay. Yeah. Maybe you want to add a bit, because that was a very interesting aspect of the, the report in Yemen. On the, on the, the informal community leaders. Yes. Uh, um, it's quite problematic at the village level. There is a community leader who was designated by the by the state, and uh, every uh, person wants to get to be a beneficiary. Application has to be processed through this village leader, and he has to stamp it and get paid for it. And uh, so, uh, the be the non beneficiaries and beneficiaries cannot complain that they, they do not have grievances system. Uh, usually they complain to the village leader about somebody else, but not about him, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is quite obvious. Uh, the, uh, in one of the areas, there was some respect or trust with the uh, uh, local council, but in the other uh, area, there was lack of trust, and they think if there was a system, they would complain about this local, lo local council themselves. So that's uh, the case. Thank you very much. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time, sadly, because there's so much more we could discuss. Uh, but there will be a, a, a round table this afternoon. Um, there will also be, you'll be able to have a second chance to see this if you uh, go online, because it's going to be online within 48 hours. Uh, but uh, let's uh, finish by thanking all the participants uh, on the panel and all of you who raised such great questions. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.